The Bible says it is with the mind that we serve the Lord. It is with the mind that we serve the Lord. The mind is the battleground. It is the place where the greatest conflict is. There are more people in this room having trouble in their mind than there are people having trouble in their finances. The struggle is in your mind. This is why we have people who go to bed tired and wake up tired. Slept eight hours and you wake up still tired. The reason you wake up tired is that you got sleep but you didn't get rest. Your mind has been in turmoil all night long. You've been wrestling in your sleep. Have you ever woke up and your bed was wet? The bed is all torn just like you've been in a fight because your mind has not rested. Your body went to sleep but your mind is still caught up in a warfare. Your mind is the battleground. Touch somebody and tell them the enemy is after your mind. Out to worry you to death, out to stress you to death, out to break you down, out to make you quit, out to make you think that you can't get up, out to make you give up on your dream. The warfare is in your mind. It's not in your checkbook. It's not in your savings account. It's not on your job. The fight that you got to fight is in your mind. And if you whip it in your head, you can whip it in your checkbook. You can whip it on your job. You can whip it out of your children. But you gotta cry out of your head. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Paul says, take a stand, withstand and then stand in the evil day. And believe me, the battle for your soul begins in your mind. If Satan can control your thoughts, he'll control your destiny. Because I assure you, when Satan sees you walking down the road like this, he will totally destroy you. You can't possibly survive in your own strength. Why are so many Christians decimated right now? Why are they just absolutely falling out because they don't have the strength to endure? The Bible says, be strong in the Lord. Say that with me, be strong in the Lord. That means put on this whole armor. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can get nothing from heaven without faith. Salvation comes by faith. Healing comes by faith. Peace, love, and joy come by faith. You are no match for the prince of darkness. But when you put on the whole armor of God, you are more than a conqueror. You can look the devil in the eye and say, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Get out of my life. Get out of my thoughts. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my home. Get away from my children. Get away from my health. The power and the anointing of God are with me. And I am the conqueror here. Resist steadfast in the faith. The translation is fight him and fight him every day. Resist him and resist him every day. James writes, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Take a stand means you refuse to be intimidated by Satan who comes as a roaring lion according to 1 Peter 5. In nothing be not terrified by your adversary. In nothing be not terrified by your adversary. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The truth is not something. The truth is someone. That someone is Jesus Christ. And when you know him, you have the truth. And you walk in the truth. And you joy in the truth. And you rejoice with truth that is unspeakable and unshakable. Because Christ is the solid rock, the cornerstone, precious and elect in Zion. He's not trying to be truth. He is the truth.
I want to put on the whole armor of God and come out fighting with fresh fire, that I can be counted worthy to be numbered among the New Testament saints. As believers in Jesus Christ, we believe in a living God, a God who is, a God who is alive, a God who is all-powerful and almighty, a God who is faithful and merciful and kind, a God who is able to do the impossible. He is able to go beyond human limitations and operate beyond the borders of our mind's understanding. One touch from Jesus Christ, one encounter with Him, and you will find that He is able. He's able to turn your life around. He's able to transform your heart and mind. So be encouraged, dear friend. Be encouraged, for our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I'm going to tell you something that every successful person has to do, including you. Believe it or not, every successful person in this world has jumped. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. You eventually, you are going to have to jump. You cannot just exist in this life. You have got to try to live. If you are waking up thinking that it's got to be more to your life than it is, man, believe that it is. Believe in your heart of hearts that it is. But to get to that life, you're going to have to jump. Now, I'll tell you why I call it jumping. When you see people in life, when you're standing on the cliff of life and you see people soaring by, and you see people soaring, going to exotic places, you hear about them doing wonderful things. Maybe you look up the street and your neighbor just gets a car every year, every two years. You know, how is he doing that? Have you ever thought, maybe this person right here has identified their gift and is living in their gift? You just gotta quit looking at gifts as running, jumping, sing, and dance. It's more than that. It's if you know how to network, if you can connect dots, if you draw, if you teach. Some of y'all fry chicken better than anybody else. Bake pie. Some of you cut hair, color hair. Your gift, not your education. You go get an education, that's nice. But if you don't use your gift, that education only going to take you so far. I know a lot of people got degrees, man. Thing they ain't even using. It's your gift. But the only way for you to soar is you got to jump. You got to take that gift that's packed away on your back. You got to jump off that cliff and pull that cord. That gift opens up and provides the soar. If you don't ever use it, you're going to just go to work. And if you're getting up going to work on a job every day that you hate going to, that ain't living, man. You just existed. At one point in time, you ought to see what living's like. But the only way to see what living's like, you got to jump. And here's the problem. Let me just be real with you. When you first jump, let me tell you something. Your parachute will not open right away. When you jump, it's not going to open right away. You're going to hit them rocks. You're going to get some skin tore off on them cliffs. You're going to get all your clothes tore off. You're going to get some cuts on you. You're going to be bleeding pretty bad. But eventually, eventually, the parachute has to open. That ain't a theory. That's a promise. Here's another thing. You can play it safe and deal without the cuts and the tags. And you can stand on that cliff of life forever safe. But if you don't jump, I got another promise I can make. Your parachute will never open. You'll never know. If I were you, I would jump. Because that's the only way to get to that abundant life. You got to jump, man. You got to take a chance. Now, when I get through talking, there are those of you who have discussed this in the car. Well, I got bills. Whether you stay on the cliff or you jump, you're going to have bills. Well, if I quit my job, I'm going to ruin my credit. If you got a job, you live in check to check. Even if you got A1 credit, you can't buy nothing else no damn way. At one point in time, man, do yourself a favor. 
Before you leave this world, before you die, jump. Just jump one time. Just jump. Thank you very much. Here's the reality. Many of us today, you're going through a hard season. And the reality is it's easy when we hit a hard season in our, in our spiritual journey, in our life, to give up on our destiny and dream, to just quit. But I want to remind you that hard seasons are very much a part of God's divine plan for your life. That sometimes easy and fun doesn't always mean fruitful. That sometimes the seasons of greatest growth and advancement for us are the ones that are hard. Maybe you've lived through or are living through your own storm. The problem is that most people don't know how to profit from their problems. Most people never learn how to harvest their hurts, how to learn from their losses. Mature believers, though, they do those things. They advance through adversity. And if you don't do that, instead of becoming better, you're going to become bitter and God's not going to be able to use you the way that he wants to. So you got to trust him in difficult situations that even when it looks like everything is breaking down around you, if you trust in the Lord, you can experience incredible breakthrough and see God work in mighty, miraculous ways. When you feel and see nothing, believe by faith that God is up to something. You see, the struggle is a setup. When Joseph was falsely accused and put into prison for 13 years. 13 years he was put into prison at a hard spot, hard season. This is what Psalm says about him in 105, 18. It says that he was laid in chains of iron and his soul entered into that iron. That's a powerful verse. What is that saying? That's saying there was something that happened on the inside of him when he was put into a hard place. Perseverance grew. His prayer life grew. His faith grew. Strength grew on the inside. There was something that happened in that place when he was chained up, when he was in prison, that could only be solidified in him during that place, during that hard time. What am I saying, friends? There are some things that only come to us spiritually the hard way. And they're not fun and and we don't like to praise and shout about it. But the reality is, is there is great hope knowing that though it's hard, God is up to something. That though it is hard, God is doing a significant work in my life. That though it is hard, God is preparing me for something that is ahead of me. If you believe it, can you say amen? And though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. You see, in order to develop real quality, it takes time and it takes pain and it takes endurance and it takes grief and it takes trouble and it takes turmoil and it takes destruction and demolition. Demolition is a messy thing. If you get ready to remodel your house, expect to have some mess. Everything you're going through is preparing you for what you ask God for. You just got to quit tripping while you're in the process because the process is necessary. You may not see it now, but when he gets you on the other side of it, you're going to see exactly why it went that way. And you're going to be okay with it. Everyone wants a miracle, but no one wants to be put in the crisis that requires a miracle. The only way you really need a miracle is that you have a problem. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the miracle you need. We like miracles, but not the problems that go with them. But sooner or later, it's going to happen to you. The phone is going to ring and your calm, tranquil, well-ordered life is instantly going to be in a raging storm. Sooner or later, you're going to face a crisis beyond your power to control. Our God is a God who wants to perform the miraculous in your life. There are times in our lives where we face something that it just seems like there's no way out. We could do all the math in our mind and our mind will tell us there's nothing that can be done here. Maybe you're in a job and, and, and you know God wants to bless you, but you look at your situation and you think, well, God can't move here. My boss doesn't like me. My, I can't get along with the other people at work. There's, there's such a ceiling in my environment 
It's impossible for God to move in this situation. Other times we might say, well, my marriage, Pastor, it's just so bad. It's been so many years that it's been sliding in the wrong direction. I, I don't know that God could ever move our marriage into the position that he keeps talking about. How is God going to change these things in my life? Pastor, I've been attacked in my body for so long, and the diagnosis is that it's incurable. Nothing can be done here. I'm not sure that God could even move. I don't know what he would do. And our brain starts to opt us out of God's best in our lives. It says, well, the impossible things, I don't know that God still does that anymore. We begin to forget the things in our past where God did perform the miraculous. Can you think back to a time when God did something miraculous in your life that no one could explain? Something happened and you got a breakthrough when there seemed to be no way. There was a miracle that happened in your life that could not be explained with the mind. The mind wants to get in your way. It wants to say, well, that's impossible. A lot of people believe in the Bible. They believe in the miracles in the Bible. What they don't believe is that God will do it for them and do it now. That's what faith is, believing that God can do it for you and do it right now. Um, there, we, we, we live in a world where everyone's telling you, you can't pull this off. Um, we live in a time when, when people even in the church don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and what he can do. Um, sometimes we just look at the scriptures and go, well, yeah, that was back then. And you yeah, guys, it, it, it's, it's not about back then. It's, it's about always. It's about ever since the beginning of this book and all the way to the end, it, the followers of God were filled with courage. There was a fearlessness in them. There was a confidence of my God will come through. We grew up with these stories. We, we really did. And don't you remember as a kid just having this faith like God can do anything? God loves to work best and shine his glory when things seem the darkest. When the Israelites were in a situation where they're hemmed in by the mountains, they couldn't escape the mountains. They had the sea in front of them, they couldn't swim across that, and the Egyptians were coming in, and God had positioned them there. You'd think, they thought, well, why, why, what is going on? This is impossible. You know what? Even when it looks impossible, God can either blow up the mountains or he can part the sea. He's going to figure it out. We just have to keep believing that no matter how impossible it looks, God can still do it. I don't know how he's going to come through in this financial situation, but here's what I do know. I know that my God will meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I don't serve a God of the practicals. I serve a God of the miracles. The God of the Bible is a miracle working God. In the genesis of time, he breathed into a handful of dirt and Adam became a living soul. That was a miracle. He separated the day from the night. He flung the glittering stars against the velvet of the night to glisten like diamonds as an eternal reminder to mankind that he is the infinite creator. He set the sun ablaze and placed it in the heavens as his version of the eternal flame. The infinite power of God to create is far beyond our imagination to grasp. The God of this Bible is a God of might and miracles. He's a God of grace and glory. He's a God of power and patience. Moses parted the Red Sea and walked across on dry ground with almost two million people. He healed the lame, he healed the deaf, he healed the blind. That, my friend, is miracle Always working power. About being average. But I want to tell you something. I stand here before you, before all of these people, not listening to those words, but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars, to be the best that I can be. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. And better isn't good enough if it can be best. That's when you hit rock bottom, remember this. While you're struggling, rock bottom can also be a great foundation on which to build and on which to grow. Person that gets up off the canvas and keeps growing, that's the person that will continue to grow their influence. 
This woman was the finest woman I'd ever seen in my life. We're at this dance and I find out her name is Trina Williams from Lompoc, California. And, and we were all dancing and we're, we're just, just excited. And I decide in the middle of dancing with her that I would ask her for a phone number. The next day we walk to Basket and Robin's ice cream parlor. My friends couldn't believe it. This has been 40 years ago and my friends still can't believe it. We go on a second date and a third date and a fourth day. We go together for a year, two years, three years, four years. By now, Trina's a senior in college. So now it's, it's, it's time to propose. We get married, we have a few children. Our lives are great. One day, Trina finds a lump in her left breast, breast cancer. Six years after that diagnosis, me and my two little boys walked up to mommy's casket. And for two years, my heart didn't beat. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. If it wasn't for those two little boys, there would have been no reason for which to go on. I was completely lost. That was rock bottom. You know what sustained me? The wisdom of a third grade dropout. We're at the casket in College Station, Texas. I'd never seen my dad cry, but this time I saw my dad cry. That was his daughter. Trina was his daughter, not his daughter-in-law. And I'm right behind my father about to see her for the last time on this earth. And my father shared three words with me that changed my life right there at the casket. It would be the last lesson he would ever teach me. He said, son, just stand. Just stand. You keep standing. You keep standing, no matter how rough the sea, you keep standing. And I'm not talking about just water. You keep standing. No matter what you don't give up. I learned that lesson from a third grade dropout who was a cook at Cal Maritime, who said, boy, you keep standing, no matter what, you keep standing, no matter what you don't give up, no matter what you don't give up, no matter what you don't give up, no matter what you don't give up. No what you don't give up. Promise of his, he ain't never lied, he always come through. The question is, what are you looking at? Are you focused on the problem or are you focused on the God that's bigger than the problem? If you focus on the problems, you are going to tremble in fear rather than move forward in faith. Fear exaggerates the problem. Faith sees beyond the problem to the God that wants to solve it. Fear sees the problem as bigger than God. Faith sees God bigger than the problem. The issue is never the size of your problem, it's always the size of your God. Because if you have a small God, there is no problem that won't be too big. And you will never ever ask God to do big things. It just won't happen. Because here's the thing, even when I say, do you have a small God? God doesn't get small. It's just our vision of him is small. Quit tying God's hands and take the limits off of it. When you give in to weariness, you lose your strength. When you start thinking, it's not fair. It's been so long. It's never going to work out. The energy you need to move into your destiny is being drained out. I'm not asking you to never feel weariness. It will come. I'm asking you to not allow it in. When you're weary, you won't have the passion, the determination, the courage to fight the good fight of faith. Don't let battle fatigue keep you from your victory. Don't let weariness stop your dream from coming to pass. You are closer than you think. When it's the most difficult, you face the greatest temptation to settle, that means the victory is near. The promotion, the healing, the breakthrough is about to show up. I want to ask you this question. If you could do something impossible, what would it be? Now maybe it would be some exploit for God. Something that God's laid on your heart. Maybe if you could do something impossible, it would be in the realm of a relationship. What would it be that you'd like God to do that's impossible? Well, I have wonderful news for you tonight. God wants to do the impossible for you, his child. 
People that don't have God or His power do great things all the time. God doesn't call you to do great things. God calls you to do impossible things. Listen to these few quotes. I love them dearly. A.W. Tozer, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. I love this next sentence. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. George Mueller, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. The great missionary Amy Carmichael to India, when you're facing the impossible, you can count on the God of the impossible. I love this quote from Warren Wiersbe. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what seems impossible. D.L. Moody, if God is your partner, make your plans big and impossible. We say, Brother Gibbs, those are the words of men. Well, listen to these verses. Jeremiah 22, 17, O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth, and by thy great power stretched out thine arm. There is nothing Nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, he asks, that's too hard for me? Matthew 19, 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Have you ever noticed we stop talking about the impossible? And yet we serve the God of the impossible. All of us at some point in our life have had our backs to the wall and we think, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know which way to turn. What shall I do? We've had our backs to the wall and everything looked rather impossible. It looks impossible for us to be able to get through this without a great deal of pain or hurt. It looks impossible for us to get through this without some real financial problems developing. It looks impossible for us to be healed after what the doctor said. So there are all kinds of situations we come into. The first thing I want you to notice here is this, and that is that Jesus is aware of those circumstances in which we feel it is a seemingly impossible situation. You notice I didn't say an impossible situation, but seemingly impossible. It appears to be impossible. It looks like it's impossible. For example, when you and I hit one of those difficult situations in life, or we our backs to the wall, or we think something looks impossible, what do we say? We say, oh Lord, what am I going to do? Wrong question. Now remember, this is real important because you're going to get one of these. Lord, what, what, what am I going to do? What in the world am I going to do? How many of us have asked that? Oh God, what in the world am I going to do? That's not the right question. The right question is, Lord, what are you going to do? Nothing is impossible when the supernatural invasion of God by the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our life and He enters our circumstance to deal with them. If I and I alone have to deal with them, I'm going to have a problem. But if He begins to deal with them, He, if I allow Him, if I acknowledge Him, if I call upon Him into my circumstance, He is going because of His compassion and love to deal with that circumstance no matter what it is. And oftentimes we wonder why things don't happen right. We wonder why, why we can't figure it out. God doesn't want us figuring it out. He wants us to rely upon Him, to trust in Him, and as, as He says, to call upon Him. Not only is He aware of our circumstance, but listen, He always, listen, He always has a plan for our seemingly impossible circumstances. That is, Jesus is never caught off guard. That is, He always knows what He's going to do, and He knows how He's going to do it, and He knows how, where, when, and He knows exactly the resources that are necessary. No matter what you're facing in life, He knows exactly what to do. So I'm, I'm going to stop my calculation. I'm going to start trusting and see what you do. You'll be amazed at what God can turn around in your life. 
and I come into my junior year and I'm about to get exactly what I want. About to get this thing called NFL. And I'm 10 games away from this dream that I wanted my whole life, right? This thing that I've been working for my whole life. My whole life is dedicated to this one game. I'm up Saturday mornings, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, two miles to a fire station, two miles back home. I'm in the park, 9.30, 10 at night, doing everything in my life surrounded the game of football. I'm sitting at home at night. I'm throwing balls up to the ceiling, and I'm catching them different type of ways, trying to see if a receiver was to check me, if I wanted to catch an intercept. Like, everything revolved around this game, and I finally get in a position in my life to where now I'm 10 games away from it. I got the paperwork that states I'm about to be an NFL draft pick. NFL on top of the paper. Inky Johnson projected top 30 automatic multi-millionaire. Now all you have to do, the hard part's over. Just play the next 10 football games, Ink. You, you, you made it. And I go out in a silly game against Air Force, two minutes left, and I go to make a tackle that I can make with my eyes closed. And I hit this guy, and as soon as I hit him, I knew it was a problem, but I didn't think it would be this type of problem. Like, you know how when things happen, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't expect that. But I don't think it's going to be anything too crazy. And when I hit him, every breath in my body left. My body goes completely limp. I fall to the ground. I blacked out. My eyes open. I'm still not, you know, too concerned because it's football. I told Pastor, I never thought about a career in an injury. You have injuries within the game. When my eyes open, guys run over. Ink, let's rock, man. Let's go. Let's finish him off. And I'm like, I, I can't. Like, what do you mean you can't? You're a starting corner. Get up. You can nurse your injury after the game, man. I'm like, no, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. It's a shock. Neck to my toes. I can't feel anything. Shock leaves. It stays in my right arm and hand. I'm like, maybe I got a bad stinger. They put me on the spine board, willing me off the field. Doctor says to me as he's walking beside me, I don't know how you're still alive, son. You don't have any pulse. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there. I'm like, Pops, I laid it on him, right? I put it on him, right? My dad's like, yeah, but I think you got the worst part of this one, Doctor say, we're going to take you over, run a couple tests, bring you back into the room. Everything will be cool. They run the test. They bring me back into the room. Mom comes in, kisses, prays. Son, you'll be fine. She's going to walk out. Doctors rush in. Head boy says, hey, ma'am, got to rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. And I look at him and I want to ask him, like, man, you can't use another word. Like, use a synonym, brother. <laughs> how y'all say die? Like, you sure die, man? And he could tell from how I'm looking at him that I'm questioning him. And he says to me, you ruptured a subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. If we don't perform this surgery tonight, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. From seven years old to 20 years old, boiled down to one moment. The sacrifice, the dedication, the commitment came down to one moment. And the next morning I woke up from that surgery, the NFL on my scale of life, that big. SEC championship, that big. Cornerback, that big. I was embarrassed. I'm sitting there and people coming into my room like, Inky, man, um, I'm sorry about what happened to you. And I'm saying to myself, uh, man, Inky, you really messed it up this time. Like, man, that's really the only thing you wanted, huh? Like, you just thought because you grew up in this um, so-called hood, two-bedroom home, 14 people. Like, the only thing you really wanted was the NFL. That's it. I'm like, man, you limited God to that? Like, life holds no substance, no value. Like, efficient but not effective. I did things right, but I never did the right thing. And now the thing I placed my identity in, now it was gone. That's why I laugh at people when they say, man, if I could just get this, I'll be... Man, if I could just get this position, I'll be, woo. Man, if I could just get this amount of money, I'll be, I'm like, woo. But what happens even if you get it or you don't get it? What happens when God says yes and no? Like, do you have the ability to accept what you don't understand? Can you still see God's plan when it didn't go the way that you thought it would go? 
Can you handle when things get off course? I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, man, I'm eight games away and God is redirecting me. And I'm like, God, just let me get to the NFL, then redirect me. Like, let me get the contract, then redirect me so I can help my family. And God is like, no, son, I need you to really go that way. And I'm like, you sure? Like, man, I need to go this way. He's like, no, I need you to go this way. I got something greater for you. Now, it might take a little longer to manifest, but I got something even sweeter. Like, I got something more fulfilling. I got something more rewarding. I got something, son, that's going to carry you for the rest of your life. Like, it's an amazing thing. I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing when one day I'm backstage and I got the same feeling that I got when I used to be in the tunnel before I was running out of Neyland Stadium. And I said, thank you, God. And so now I live my life a certain type of way according to what God has done. I live my life a certain type of way according to the power that I know the Lord possess. I live my life a certain type. Like when I go to the Lord in prayer, I go bold. And every time I go bold, I'm so thankful that that's not me and my Lord's first time communicating. And people have the nerve to ask me all the time, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? You got a paralyzed right arm and hand. I'm like, if you only knew and if you only saw the works that God has done in people's lives around me, what he's done in me, yeah, it's great, it's cool. But what God has done in the people's lives around me, like, you can't put a price on that. Like, at a certain point, like, what is it really about? Like, and I know the initial reaction when we go through things is to say, man, why did this have to happen to me? And it's an honest reaction. Because sometimes good people go through some crazy stuff. And some of the things we go through, I'm going to just be real, it's not, a, it's not a scripture for it. It's not. You can't go, hey, go to Romans 2-2. They're like, what? It's not. But this is what I've understood. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. And so when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. The only thing I ask of you, as talented, as brilliant, as powerful, as beautiful as you are, never allow life to make you forget why you started in the first place. Meaning that first time you said, man, I'm riding with Christ, let's go. That first feeling you got, like that first interaction, that first connection you got, like when you first got it. It's like when people say at, at the beginning, everybody is excited, everybody is on fire, but at a certain point you hit something along the journey and it's going to test that level of commitment. At a certain point, you're going to hit something that's going to test that level of faith. And my definition of commitment was always staying true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Like, am I going to stay true to my beliefs and my core and my essence of who I am as an individual, even if I get a paralyzed right arm and hand? Am I going to stay true to it, even if my little career that I thought I was going to have disappears? Am I going to stay true to it, even if one day I'm in a football game, the thing I love to do, the thing I've been practicing my whole life, and in one moment it gets wiped out? Am I going to stay true to it? Because depending upon if I'm going to stay true to it, a lot of other people's belief in their Christian journey is predicated upon that and my belief in my Christian journey. In other words, I've seen a lot of other people say, Inky, I want to give my life to Christ, not because of something that happened with me, but because of something I've seen happen to you. And so when ESPN comes to me and say, Ink, you wouldn't be in the NFL right now? I'm like, if you only knew. If you only knew my father got saved because of my injury. If you only knew, my three boys that went first round to the NFL, all of them got saved. If you only knew. If you only knew, my mother, the level of effect, like, if you only knew. Like, I just seen God do some things through the injury, and I'm like, man, I just, every day I wake up, I just try to stay out of his way. I'm going to leave you with this. We already know what to do when God says yes. We already know what to do when we get blessed. We already know what to do when our prayers get answered. But the question that I have for you in this rhetorical, what will you do when God says no? Not being the strongest version of yourself. And all of this resistance accumulates. It grows so heavy that your body feels like it's going to break. So what do we do when we feel like we're on the brink of destruction? What do we do when we feel like the weight has become so unbearable? We need to learn to lift that weight. 
Not because of who we are now, but because of who we know we are to become. Don't you ever let somebody tell you you can't do it. You have a dream, a purpose, you gotta protect it. It's the people that can't do it themselves that'll tell you that you can't do it. You can do it, period. You see, it's impossible not to feel pain. But to not feel pain, you have to live too cautiously to even be living at all. You see, you may not get that job the first time, or the next one, or the one after that. But here's the thing, you don't quit, you don't give up. You get back up and prepare for the next one. You see, the biggest enemy you have to deal with is yourself. You don't have to personally be perfect to do great things. You just need to want it bad enough to get up and do something about it. You gotta dig deep down within you and ask yourself, who do I want to be? Not what, but who? Now just look at your challenges like the plates that you slap on the barbell, your failed relationships, adversaries that attack you, your broken heart, lost job. When you look at them this way, you see a way to overcome them. Now God doesn't send troubles to you, but just remember that each one of these obstacles are designed to strengthen weaknesses within your own character. Stop running away from your challenges. You see, it's easy to be on the bottom. It doesn't take any effort to be a loser. But you see, the opportunities that come into your life mean nothing unless you take full advantage of them. It's with repetitive action that you get stronger. And in that same way, by overcoming obstacles in your life over and over again through faith, you get stronger. Once you understand this, you not only accept these challenges, but as men, you beg for them. As you mature in Christ, as you grow and develop in your knowledge of God, the Holy Spirit will work within you to broaden your horizons and shift your perspective. So the experiences that I go through, the hardships, the difficulties, the testings, the trials, the sorrows, they're all a part of God's necessary preparation. As he is seeking to prepare the vessel to be used by the master, as he empties me of myself, that he might fill me with his fullness, that I no longer live for my own glory, but I live now for his glory that I serve him in such a way that it brings glory to him. Many Christians have the expectation that once they are saved, life will be blissful and filled with joy all the time. There is this notion that there will be an endless supply of blessings. Now, of course, we are promised good things by the Lord. For example, Psalm 23, verse 6, tells us that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And Philippians 4, 13 tells us that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So even though we are promised good things and blessings, some of us tend to want the option of handpicking what we want from God. We want to select what we want, how we want it, and when we want it. And a lot of us forget what the Bible says in Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A lot of us forget that the Bible in Psalm 34, verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. That says to me that Life won't be rosy all the time, but I won't fear because God is with me and he will give me comfort. It says to me that I will have to face and go through some dark valleys, but God will be with me. And if you read Psalm 23, verse 5, the Bible says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Bible is telling us that we will definitely have enemies, 
Not everyone is going to be for you. Not everyone will like you. Because if they did, if no one opposed you, then there would be no need for the Lord to prepare a table before them. So although God has given us several promises, promises of strength and blessing, promises of protection and provision, that doesn't mean there will never be a time where we won't feel challenged. But instead, it's in those moments that we should hold on tightly to the hand of God and raise our faith. Because that is the only way that we can see the goodness of the Lord. So if you find yourself in that position where it appears as though your life is under attack, allow Jesus to be the one who dictates how and when you get through that situation. Allow the Lord to be in the driver's seat. Now, I began this message by saying many Christians have the expectation that once they are saved, life will be blissful and filled with joy all the time. This is obviously the wrong expectation to have. It's simply not realistic. So instead, I encourage you to expect some challenges in life. But expect to overcome through the power in the blood of Jesus. Expect to face a Goliath or two. But also expect the might and power of the Holy Spirit to see you through. Expect to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But people of God... You should also expect that the Good Shepherd will be looking out for you. His rod and staff will be right there to provide you with comfort. Expect adversity. Expect the lion's den. Expect the Red Sea. But expect Jesus Christ to deliver you out of each and every situation. In God's Word, we are told that we will have to endure trials, experience some pain, and encounter some disappointments. It's not what we like to hear, but think of it this way. If God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, one who was pure, holy, and blameless, only to then watch him carry all of the sins of this world and be crucified, is that not a painful experience? With everything that Jesus went through, the persecution, the physical pain and torture, who are we to then say to God, why did you send me this disappointment in my life? Why did you let this event happen that made me feel some pain? We need to get things in the right perspective. We are following Christ. We are following His example. And we should be confident that despite everything He went through, in the end, He wins. Now, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes when Christians experience trials and distress, there can be a tendency to despair. For some, they even fall into depression. Some of the Bible greats like David, Abraham, Moses, all suffered some level of disappointment and deep despair. And for the Christian man or woman listening today, I want you to know that although you are not immune to disappointments, there is a way to gain victory over mental anguish and emotional despair. Now, while I could give something like five easy steps to a healthy emotional state during tough times, let me instead tell you that there is only a single step that needs to be taken. And that step is trusting in Jesus Christ, relying on Jesus Christ, and coming to a place where you say, Lord, my life is in your hands, and you truly mean it. Of course, one may now ask, how do I do that? And it's a good question. The answer starts with knowing what the Bible teaches. It's through the Word of God and it's through prayer in those dark times that the Lord ministers to us and breaks through any dark clouds of any depression or anxiety we face. One thing that might help give some perspective is to know and truly believe that God is sovereign. The Lord is truly in control. And because of that, we can have the assurance that for those who belong to Him, He will work all things for their good and His glory. So here's my words of encouragement to you. God's promises are our source of strength. Should you find yourself in difficulty, stand on God's promises. If you're being afflicted, 
persecuted or rejected by this world, there is a promise in the Word of God for you. A promise that God will deliver you. A promise that tells you, you are blessed and you will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but my hope is in Jesus. My hope is Jesus. I will hold tightly and confess that if I need healing, Jesus Christ is a healer. If I need peace, Jesus Christ offers me peace beyond, beyond all understanding. There's purpose in your pain. Whenever it feels like the devil is attacking, when he's testing you, it's important to remember that sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. Sometimes God's preparation, it comes packaged as pain. In other words, there is a purpose in your pain. God might be using the pain that we're enduring to do something in us before he does something through us. Maybe the very thing that you've dreaded the most is what God might use to develop you in a way that he can only use that. In fact, the stronger the pain might be an indication of the bigger the purpose that God has on the other side. So when I don't see the point and I feel like my life is being dismantled, could it be that God's preparation comes packaged as pain? And maybe if you could see it that way, it wouldn't take the pain away, but it would give the pain a purpose. If you could see what you've been calling a failure really wasn't a failure, it was a foundation. See, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you when it shows up, I am your preparation. I believe in this. The, 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 the thing that you saw as a betrayal, what if you just decided, I'm not going to see it as a betrayal anymore? He was preparing me. Pain is an instrument in God's hand to sow into you perseverance, to put something good in you. That's what a good parent does. That's what a good teacher does. I'm going to put you in pain, but for a purpose. Not to destroy you, but to build you. To sow into you perseverance. The ability to abide even under greater weight. There's purpose in your pain today. God will use it for great purposes if you allow him. He uses this test of faith. That testing carries the idea of a refiner's fire. He's assuming you have faith. This is someone who trusts God, believes God's guiding their story. And that faith is put into a fire. Why? To purify it, to make it better than it is now. And so God will do that with your life. And if you understand that, you can have joy even in the pain. You have the mind of Christ. Let me say it again. You have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. We have the mind of Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 7. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind. You have the mind of Christ. Ephesians 6, 17, put on the helmet of salvation. Philippians 4, 8 through 9, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. You have the mind of Christ. Don't believe the lies. Don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on what you hear from the enemy inside your head. Cast that thing out. You have the mind of Christ. So don't give in to discouragement today. No way.
Not today. You have the mind of Christ. The enemy is coming to steal and to kill and to destroy, but not today. You have the mind of Christ. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you are on the winning side. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You are on the winning side. God has given you the mind of Christ. It's time to think God thoughts. It's time to think faith thoughts. It's time to think hope thoughts. It's time to think joy thoughts. It's time to think love thoughts. It's time to think patient thoughts. It's time to think good thoughts. It's time to think heaven thoughts. It's time to think Jesus thoughts. It's time to think God thoughts about who you are, who he's made you to be, what today is going to be, what you're going to do today, how capable you are because Christ is in you and he is the hope of glory. You are wildly capable. You are creative because he's made you in his image. You bear the image of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. It's time to win.